Well, my name is Mark LeBaron. I'm the current uh, chair of the International Sculpture Center, and it's my pleasure to welcome everyone to this uh, great conference today. Uh, it's great to see so many people here. I believe that our conference is a great event because it attracts peoples from all corners of the sculpture world and provides a wonderful opportunity to make new friends and get new perspectives on sculpture. We have almost 400 people here representing 10 countries. We also have 40 students that are attending on scholarship. Take this opportunity to learn from one another and learn more about sculpture and how it impacts our lives. Our conference is packed with many great activities. My only advice would be prepare yourself for what you want to experience the most. One of my favorite quotes is, life is 10% what happens to me and 90% of how I react to it. That's what makes this conference worthwhile. What you decide to take away from this conference will not be the same as mine, but believe me, your own unique experience is what will be special. I'd like to take uh, just a moment and thank some of the individuals and groups that have really worked so hard to make this conference a success. Uh, first would be our sponsors. I won't, at this point, read all their names. There's very many. But without uh, the sponsorship, this conference would not be possible. Uh, I'd also like to thank our advisory committee and the members of the uh, Chicago Sculpture International Group, uh, the local chapter who's done such a great job in preparing and working to make this conference a success, including getting uh, numerous uh, sculptures up throughout the, the city uh, coordinated with this uh, event. If you would, let's give that uh, group a big round, <coughs> round of applause. <coughs> <coughs> Finally, I'd like to, <coughs> excuse me, uh, <coughs> thank the IS. <coughs> well, this is great. <coughs> These kind of events really choke me up. Um, I'd, I'd also like to thank uh, our IS, ISC group and the team here that's worked so hard to do this, especially Johanna Hutchinson. Johanna, would you stand and be recognized? <laughs> so now I'd like to uh, move on and introduce our keynote speaker, Edward Euler. Mr. Euler was appointed design director of Millennium Park by Chicago Mayor Richard M. Daley in 1998. In this capacity, he oversaw the construction and completion of the 24 and a half acre park and coordinated the contributions of world-class artists and architects. <clears throat> Excuse me. Mr. Euler now, Euler now serves as the park's director of planning, as well as the executive director of the not-for-profit Millennium Park, Inc., and serves as a consultant for the planning and design of the parks. This, his extensive experience with public art in the Chicago Park District make him the perfect person to begin the 23rd International Sculpture Center uh, Conference. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Euler. Well, thank you for inviting me. I was uh, fortunate, fortunate enough to be asked about four years ago to speak on a panel in Seattle for your conference. And afterwards, uh, somebody came up to me and said, you know, you were so refreshing and honest. So today I'll try to be even more honest when I talk about uh, Millennium Park and, and sculpture in Chicago. So uh, sculpture has had an enormous impact on Chicago. And for 25 years, I worked at the Chicago Park District and was in charge of restoring, documenting all of the major pieces of public art, over 100 pieces of public art. A couple of them I was in charge of um, were the Mestrovic Equestrian Indians. There are two of them. This is the Bowman, right at the Congress in Michigan Avenue and the Rado Taft's The Fountain of Time, which was an enormous restoration effort and took a long time and cost quite a bit of money, but an incredible piece of sculpture. Uh, by the way, the, uh, the uh, horse is, is wearing some socks that say socks. This was probably when the socks actually won the pennant, which was a few years ago. Doesn't happen very often in Chicago. But we're fortunate to have some major pieces of public art from some of the great sculptors and artists from around the world, including Pablo Picasso's uh, 
Corten piece, which was a gift of the artist to Chicago. Alexander Calder, of course. Richard Hunt is a local uh, sculptor who's done things all over the world, many pieces in Chicago. Uh, Klaus Oldenburg's bat column at the um, federal um, building on, uh, I think it's on Washington Street. Jean Moreau's uh, Chicago, uh, right across from the Civic Center. Uh, Jean uh, Dubuffet's piece at the uh, State of Illinois building. I'm sure you'll see all of these pieces at some point in your visit to Chicago. Uh, Richard Serra, I was actually responsible for locating the Richard Serra, probably not in the best location, it's in Grant Park. But it was donated um, by a company because uh, it was going to be in the lobby of their building. And um, it was just too heavy, it would have collapsed the floor, so they donated it to Chicago so we could locate it uh, then on the axis of Buckingham Fountain, which you see in the background. And the new piece, the Agora, um, 106 headless figures, each nine feet high, uh, at the south end of Grand Park. And very interesting, um, unfortunately, a lot of the dogs uh, were intrigued by this piece and thought there were trees. So dogs are banned from the area, by the way. Two uh, temporary pieces that have uh, occurred in 2010, 2011, Tony Tassett's Eye, which is a fiberglass piece which is located in a park on State Street. Temporary, but it caused a huge sensation. And probably the more controversial one is, is, Mar is Forever Maryland uh, by Stuart Johnson. And it caused quite a, a stir in the art world in Chicago. The Sun Times, uh, said, even worse than the sculpture itself is the photo op behavior it's inspiring. Men and women licking Marilyn's leg, gawking up her skirt, pointing, pointing at her giant panties as they leer and laugh. So uh, this actually just got sold recently for $5.6 million, and now it's been shipped, to, I think, to California. So even bad art, according to the critics, has value. So I'm going to talk about one project that I've been involved with since 1998, and that's uh, the creation of many Millennium Park and the impact it's had on Chicago. Its location is in the northwest corner of Grant Park. The site is outlined before construction started, and the site was pretty horrible. It was, uh, and by the way, uh, in the middle of Grant Park is Buckingham Fountain. We're using that as a as a model for how we raise money from the private sector for Millennium Park, because Kate Buckingham uh, donated uh, $400,000 to build this fountain, which was designed by Edward Bennett, and that was in 1927. She also provided a $300,000 endowment at the time, which was enough to do a partial restoration of the fountain 10 years ago for $6.5 million and we need another uh, $20 million to finish the restoration. So these endowments are important, and, and I think any piece of art that becomes a public um, piece of art needs to have an endowment to maintain it in perpetuity. Um, the reason Bologna Park happened was because we needed a home for the Grand Park Symphony Orchestra and Chorus. Uh, they are just finished their 78th year of free concerts, and their home, which was built in, uh, the second home, which was built in 1978, was totally inadequate for the kinds of crowds that were, were assembled. And this was the, probably the f uh, 3rd of July concert. Uh, Chicago always celebrates the 4th of July and the 3rd for some reason. And um, the one thing that happened was um, there was an idea that this, site in the corner of Grant Park should be converted to a permanent home for, and, and quality home for the Grant Park Symphony Orchestra. So it had been proposed from the 1970s, never had any legs because the railroads always said, well, you can have this site where, where we operate this parking lot um, for millions of dollars and, and we also sell you the air rights so you can build your, your vision of a major new um, outdoor venue. So when Mayor Daley came into office, he was abhorred by this site. He looked over 
it from his dentist office. You can see in that building right there. And every six months when he was practicing good dental hygiene, he had to be insulted by the view. So he directed staff to figure out a way to get control. And actually the attorneys of the Park District, Park District at the time found out they actually owned all the property, fee simple. And the railroads had made this claim, which was a lie, for probably over 100 years, actually 150 years, saying uh, they had rights to it. Well, they had rights to use it for railroad purposes, but the underlying ownership was the city of Chicago. So they filed a lawsuit, kicked the railroad off, and that's how the project started. And the idea was to build a new underground garage of about 3,000 spaces, uh, place a new outdoor music venue on top of the garage. The garage theoretically would pay for everything. It would be $125 million that would pay for the garage, the park. It would take a year and a half to build, and this was in 1998. And uh, frankly, the and I'm an architect, so I know how they work, uh, they pretty much lied to the mayor about the cost and the time because they wanted the job. So we owe them a debt of gratitude because the project probably wouldn't have gone forward had the mayor known what a fabrication it was. So this was the 1998 Millennium Park plan by Skid Rollins and Merrill. And it had some major problems. Um, it had received all the plan commission approvals, had been vetted with the public, everyone loved it. It was, a, um, it was actually covering over um, you know, ugly railroads and parking lots, so no one had any sort of um, concern about its architecture or its design. They just wanted to see that stuff go away. But it had a serious problem. It was not accessible to people with disabilities. Uh, there was a portion of the park right here a big overlook, which um, you couldn't get to if you're in a wheelchair. And furthermore, the, a Blue Ribbon Committee was formed to raise $30 million to add to the original estimate of $125 million for the whole project. They weren't that excited about uh, this plan. And um, so the mayor asked me to, he was high, asked me to leave the park district and take over the design of the project and fix it was my charge. He said, it'll only take two years, and then you can go and do something else. Now I'm still working on it. Uh, this is the uh, rendering that SOM did of the uh, music pavilion, and they had actually asked Frank Gehry to do a design for, for some sculptural application around the proscenium on each side. Uh, and Frank basically told him, no, he doesn't do sculpture anymore. He um, did something with them in Barcelona. It was called The Fish for a project they were doing, a big um, metal piece. And um, he, uh, SOM partner, told the donor group that Frank's not interested. So they sent me out to meet with Frank in, in Santa Monica. And I told him, well, Frank, we'd like you to do the pavilion. And he said no, because he didn't want to take away commission from some of his um, colleagues. I told him that, uh, well, if you don't do it, we'll give it to some other Pritzker Prize winner. Um, he got a little more interested. <laughs> and by the way, um, the person who said, if you do this thing, I will not give you $15 million, was Cindy Pritzker, who happens to be a good friend of Frank's. So we had a lot of inroads into convincing him to do it. Um, we rolled out the drawings. He noticed the, they had done a bridge, a cable stayed bridge. And Frank said, I've never done a bridge. I was in a competition, lost it uh, to uh, Norman Foster to bridge over the Thames. I said, if you do the pavilion, we will throw in the bridge. <laughs> and Frank said, yes. So he started out a little late. We were actually building the garage. Um, that this whole thing was going to be grounded on. This, he did many models. This is one of them. This was the, uh, as the mayor called it, the, the punk scheme. <laughs> we rejected that. And this is what we finally wound up with. Although um, it was not the one Frank preferred or myself, it was the one the major donor thought looked more like Frank, and that was Cindy Pritzker. 
and it is an incredible place. Uh, it has 4,000 fixed seats and room for another 7,000 on the lawn. It is filled to capacity with many of the concerts that are free concerts that occur over the course of the summer. And it is sculpture. I mean, there is a prohibition against building structures in Grant Park. And we had that issue with the Harris Theater. But the way we got around this was um, we said, no, um, Plan Commission, this is not a building. This is sculpture. And they bought that. <laughs> also, in the early sort of court decisions, they, they sort of exempted bandstands from uh, consideration of structures. Well, this is a big, pretty big bandstand. And it's an incredible piece of architecture and art. Uh, we, we can do all kinds of things. It can have a full, full concert. We have over 3D, 30 free concerts every year at night. It's lit up with changing colors. It's an incredible piece of art. It really needed to be large to sort of compete with the surrounding buildings. Now, we tried something interesting and different this year. This incredible sound system, which is uh, hung off the trellis, has uh, probably the best outdoor sound system in the world and a unique, unique character. So Bill Fontana, who is going to be speaking, I believe, later today, was hired by the group I work for, Millennium Park, Inc., and the School of the Art Institute, and a, a, another donor to do a, a sculptural sound piece called Soaring Echoes. And it plays in seven movements for about an hour. It's playing uh, now for the conference, and um, it's extending what we, into new areas, what, what we tried to do with all the art of Money, of Money Park. And this is a new idea, and I think it will continue to be used for experimental sound. So uh, Frank also, as I said, designed the bridge. This is his model. The mayor uh, never really liked the bridge that much. And every time I would go and present, he would take a pen out and he put a big X through the bridge, which you see right there. He said, uh, no bridge, too much Frank. But he was always looking at it from above when we showed him drawing. So in reality, we uh, ultimately convinced him that it was OK. Actually, Maggie Daly convinced him it was OK. And uh, we were able to go forward that, with it because we'd already collected $5 million from BP to, to build it. It was the only gift they received in a lump sum. So the bridge is an incredible uh, piece of sculpture. Uh, people love to cross it. The mayor's objection was, well, it doesn't really go anywhere. It's the bridge to nowhere. You've heard that expression before. And, um, but now it will be going somewhere because um, the park that's across Millennium Park to the east is now going to be named Maggie Daly Park. And it's going to be totally redesigned by Michael Van Valkenburg, uh, out of a uh, landscape architect out of New York City, or actually Brooklyn. But the bridge will then have um, um, a new um, sort of herd of people crossing over to get to this new fantastic landscape. And it is quite beautiful. It snakes around. It's 160 feet long, or five, 960 feet long. It has a slope of 1 to 20, so it doesn't require landings or handrails. Like everything in Millennium Park, it is accessible to everyone. Uh, the Harris Theater for Music and Dance, I mentioned before, this was a challenge because there was this prohibition against building structures in the park. So we called the question by uh, getting a consent from all the adjacent property owners, um, getting the civics to endorse it, and then we went to the judge and he um, gave us permission to proceed. It's totally funded by private dollars about $52 million to build it. And it has an interesting Louise Nevelson stage cur curtain, which was used for a St. Louis opera. Uh, Joan Harris donated it to, to the uh, theater, and it hangs there today. It's one of our permanent pieces. Um, the park was so successful, the Art Institute decided to move their new addition, which is right next to us, to a location, the modern wing, right across from the park. They wanted to take advantage of that uh, the view toward Frank Gehry's pavilion and Renzo Piano, and Frank actually worked together to sort of decide how their buildings would interact. 
Uh, Renzo uh, also designed a bridge uh, which brings people from Millennium Park up to the uh, third sc outdoor sculpture level of uh, terrace of the Art Institute's new wing. And uh, Renzo's bridge had to be a little more expensive than, than Frank's. Frank's was only 14 million, and Renzo's bridge was about 28 million. And Renzo's bridge, of course, is straight, and Frank's is curvy, so there's dueling bridges in the park. But it's a great experience. If you get a chance, walk up into, or down that bridge. This is the view from, from the new modern wing toward Millennium Park. So you can see uh, that um, it really engages not only the uh, Pritzker Pavilion, but the Lurie Garden. Now, now, Catherine Gustafson, who designed the garden, considers herself a sculptor of the land. And she tipped up her garden to sort of be viewed from the Art Institute Modern Wing. And the, the plant material we consider to be a, a tapestry of ever-changing colors. So um, from spring to winter, it was designed, the plants were designed by Piet Odoff out of the Hummelow of the Netherlands. And it's an incredible display all year round. We have bulbs in the spring, so those colors are always changing. And it's really a living piece of art. And even in the winter, we leave the structure there to uh, inspire people to come to the garden. We do have uh, some other interesting art pieces. This is Patrick McGee and Adelaide Mears. Heliosphere, biosphere, and technosphere. Well, this was a, a commission that was paid for by the Exelon Company, the electric provider in Chicago. They wanted to have something that sort of talked about their mission. And we got them to donate $5 million, not only for that piece, but also to build four structures that are the Exelon pavilions. All have photo cells in the, either on the roof or the, the skin to generate electricity. And um, it, it, they are successful building. This is our visitor center. I show you this because um, people wondered how we selected the artists for Millennium Park. In the case of Cloudgate, the one that Anish Kapoor did, we had a competition, a private competition in reality. Uh, Jeremy Strick, who was the curator from the Art Institute, put together a portfolio of about 40 artists from around the world who had done major, critically acclaimed public outdoor work. And we narrowed it down. We had a committee, including myself and some architects, art patrons, gallery owners, to narrow it down to two artists. And this was Jeff Kuhn's his submission. Now, uh, they each came in to make a presentation. And Jeff's piece, which really is on this, was to be on the same location that Cloudgate sits on. Uh, Cloudgate's only about 37 feet high. This was 150 feet high. So it would be totally out of scale with the existing buildings. But if you, you kind of see, I think it's the intertwined faces of a rabbit a monkey, and I think a donkey. You can sort of see them. And the idea was you would um, start at the bottom, walk up a spiral staircase to the very 90-foot level, and you'd get on a slide, and you'd slide down <laughs> to the bottom. And we'd be picking up a lot of dead bodies at the bottom. <laughs> People couldn't quite make it or maybe shot out the slide when they're going too fast. So uh, for very obvious reasons, and also you can't have a piece of, of sculpture that, with an observation platform that's not accessible to the handicapped, so you'd have to have an elevator, and it would just got to be totally ridiculous. So we uh, paid Jeff off, and he went home, and then we got Anish Kapoor. And he had this incredible maquette, which everyone loved, and um, it is... Um, on display at the Chicago Public Library. <coughs> Anish, we asked him at the time um, how much it would cost. He said, five million. Well, it was an incredible fit, feat of engineering, too. This is um, uh, the structure inside the, the bean. And by the way, Anish doesn't name his pieces until they're finished. So everyone in Chicago named it the bean. Uh, because uh, Anish named it after everyone named it the bean, the cloud gate, because it's a gateway with a 12-foot arch. 
and it brings the sky and the down to earth. I mean, it was a, it was a nice name, but people just named it for for what they thought it looked like. Anyway, the pieces were fabricated in Oakland, California, shipped to the site, and you see some of the metal plates being installed. We had to build a gantry crane, and then um, we had to cover the whole thing with a tent because it was difficult to sort of do the finishing without uh, having the sun out and also the, um, the products of uh, fabrication were sort of hazardous to one's health. So we had to uh, contain it. And uh, these are some of the workers um, um, doing some of their usual things during the day. This is actually <laughs> lunch break. But we had an incredible team uh, of, um, of ornamental iron workers who built, built it, who are quite proud of the whole project. And, um, and uh, this is a niche, uh, seeing it for the first time. And I will quote the now famous quote, it's effing big. So it actually wound up costing about $23 million. And it's because it's made of 168 individual stainless steel plates that are from quarter of an inch to three, three eighths of an inch thick. They all had to be welded together uh, and then a very elaborate welding process to maintain the, the right color and after it was welded, after it was ground on and polished. It took uh, about 20 ornamental iron workers working a year and a half, 10 hours a day, six days a week to build this thing. And here they're wearing their respirators and Tyvek suits and doing the grinding and polishing. It was an incredible piece of fabrication. The people in the business um, said it's not possible to do it and that's why it costs so much. The only way we could get anyone to build it is to agree to do it on time and material, which means you just keep paying them until it's finished and we made sure they were working, uh, but it just took that long and, and they had to build special tools to do the grinding. And um, we opened it up um, before it was finished. Anisha was a little upset because the first phase, which only tack welded the pieces together, but we wanted, didn't want to miss the grand opening of the park in 2004. So we um, opened the whole thing up, took the tent down, hauled it away. And then after that first summer, we, we brought the tent back and then people got irate. They thought it was finished. So they were getting all kinds of bad press. So we decided to finish one end of it fairly quickly and expose it to the public. <laughs> and the workers uh, uh, referred to this not as the bean, but the boo. But as I said, it's an incredible piece of art. Uh, across uh, from Cloudgate, we installed Dan Peterman's running table. It was an earlier work he'd done and located in other parts of Grand Park, was in storage. So we brought it back. It's recycled plastic, 100 feet long, made of 2 million uh, plastic milk cartons. And it's an incredible place for events. It's fun. People love it. We wish that we could keep the birds off the top, but haven't figured a way to do that yet. If you get a chance, be sure to visit it. See this incredible. This is the Amphilus, which is looking up into the belly of the piece. And at night, it draws in um, the skyline. It's a place for events in uh, Chicago. We, every year we have different activities around it, anywhere from spinning to uh, these um, uh, Spanish uh, street theater uh, insects. Uh, Luminous Field by Sean and Petra was done as an experiment. They're art institute graduates, and for one month in the winter, uh, they provided a um, kaleidoscope of color from surrounding um, projectors and it was always changing. We had a dance event with it. So we're using art, uh, we're extending the use of art to use other media. And then it becomes the one place in Chicago where you can carol 
during the winter. Um, some people have tried to put their tongue on this in, in February, but it's just not a good thing to do. We do have a protocol, though, to remove stuck tongues from, from a cloud gate. We wish people would keep their greasy little fingerprints off of it because we spend about $50,000 a year cleaning cloud gate every day. Fingerprints are removed by custodians with microfiber cloths and special uh, solution of liquid tide and water. This was the uh, site and the design for a, a sculpture, garden, and fountain by Skidmore Owens and Merrill. Uh, we had another competition. The Crown family was encouraged by the success we had with Cloudgate to uh, want to do something, and they decided to get rid of the architect and uh, go to artists. Well, unfortunately, they went to another architect. Uh, this is Robert Venturi's uh, design for that same site that Joe Plenza has his crown fountain in. And the crowns uh, thought this resembled a, a male appendage of some sort, and they asked um, Robert to go back and rethink it, and he did, and he came back with the exact same thing. He said, I thought about it, and you need to do this. So uh, Joe Plenza was hired. He was also considered along with Maya Lin, this was his sketch for the Crown Fountain. He was an incredible salesman in terms of his passion and understanding of, of water and the human body, and his idea was to do these two corresponding towers of glass with water that would cascade the surface, and uh, the faces would be provided by uh, LED screens. So this is a cross-section, fortunately, where, where it's built over uh, two levels of an underground garage, so we could put in all the mechanical rooms under the, the piece. And they, mechanical rooms take up 27 parking spaces, so the garage operator wasn't really happy, but the mayor was uh, behind it. Uh, it's an incredible structural system, and this is definitely a collaboration between architects and engineers and artists. Um, Jome was really mu very much engaged in the whole process. We hired the local firm of Crick and Sexton to do the architecture. We had structural engineers, um, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, computer engineers, fountain designers. Uh, it was an incredible team of people who, who really figured out how to make this happen. And that's uh, Joe May. As I said, he was engaged. This is he's examining the mold for the glass bricks. There are 22,000 glass bricks that are installed on the, around the four sides. <laughs> and um, we had to do a lot of testing. This is the testing of the gargoyle effect. And the first test uh, demonstrated that the stream was a little too intense, and the uh, architect, young architect, who had to get in front of it to be tested was knocked over by the first stream of water. So we had to go back to the drawing board on that. And this is the pieces being assembled. They were fabricated in the shop, these panels, and then shipped to the site and installed. Um, each glass brick is set in a stainless steel frame, and that frame is then clipped back to the structural system. And this is the computer room underneath the in the garage that, that operates the faces and the color LEDs. It's an incredible piece of art. People love it. Uh, the artist had no idea that it would become uh, the free water theme park for Chicago, but it was um, something that we all didn't expect, and um, it's great that uh, people are prepared with their bathing suits to, uh, to experience great public art. The Art Institute initially wasn't too thrilled about the design. They considered Joe May a second-class artist, and um, they thought uh, this was more kitsch than it was serious public art. And they were opposed to the fact that we, um, it was too big, they said. They, and they didn't want it in this location because it was too close to the Art Institute. But we uh, prevailed and it was our property, so we said we're going forward. Now they love it, so <laughs> it, it, it is a, quite a sight to see how people use it. And even adults use it. And the faces, there are 1,000 of them. 
They are on for about six minutes, and then they do their little spitting routine at the very 20 seconds at the end. So uh, we had a hard time getting people to agree to be videotaped for, for the fountain. It wasn't there. So um, it was uh, a struggle to get people to sign the, the release for something they didn't know about. Now it's the most asked question about Money Park. How do I get my face in the fountain? Well, we have a thousand faces. The computer randomly selects them, and they represent Chicago's uh, diversity in terms of ethnicity, age, and gender. And uh, a thousand faces are a lot of faces. And we had the computer randomly select them so we wouldn't get the question of what time will my face be on. So we never know. We can't tell you. At night, it's an incredible um, piece of art. And even the winter, even though there's not water there, the faces are still, um, still in evidence. Never, uh, the faces he, are arranged so that there's never the same face facing off with another one. They're supposed to have a dialogue. That was Joe May's idea. And as I said before, we, we extend the use of art to include other art forms. This is the Joffrey Ballet performing in the pool around the fountain. And like everything in the park, it is accessible to people with disabilities. In fact, I received, one of the proudest things I ever received was the Paralyzed Veterans of America gave me their Barrier Free America Award about three years ago. Uh, there was a lot of concern about the fountain, uh, that it would be used for advertising, and uh, the mayor was the most concerned about this idea, and uh, he insisted that we establish some way to prevent Weed Fest or some other um, not-for-profit from having the ability to place images on the fountain. So there's a curatorial committee that uh, decides what, if anything, beyond the faces can be displayed on, on, on the project. And. Um, <laughs> We get all kinds of requests. Um, uh, they're not having a dialogue here, they're having more of an argument. And um, the, the images don't reflect my political leanings, by the way. The Boeing Galleries are a place that we do temporary exhibitions. We've had nine so far. Um, and we started out with sculpture with Mark de Suvro's exhibition. The interesting thing about the Boeing galleries, and this is before they were um, built, the plants had really developed very much. He was the first one with a sculpture. He created this piece for the park. And um, he was intrigued about coming back to Chicago and actually having something in the city because he told me the story about how he came in 1968 for the Democratic Convention and how he was protesting and, and the police hit him over the head and threw him into the fountain at Daly Plaza. So he came back when we had the dedication, the mayor was there and he mentioned that and um, the mayor was accepting of that. It was his father anyway that was involved. Uh, we had an exhibition of four Chinese artists in the Boeing galleries one year. This is, <laughs> we, we pay for a shipping and installation. We don't pay any artist fees. Uh, because uh, we can't, first of all, we have an endowment. It doesn't, doesn't produce enough that we can pay artist fees. But I think the exposures artists get are, are probably worth, worth it. And currently, um, there are four or five works by Yvonne Demenge, and she will be doing some tours and maybe even speaking at the conference. The interesting thing about this is that the uh, Mexican cultural um, government paid for their, most of their fabrication in Mexico City, and they're site-specific to Millennium Park. <clears throat> and um, what she wanted to do after their exhibition, which will come down uh, August 20th, each of these pieces will go to a, a different city. And the white piece, which is wind waves, will be going to the Nathan Mandela Sculpture Park. The, um, the yellow piece, Caliban, I forget the name. Uh, we'll be going to uh, Fort Worth, the Boo piece, Windways, way behind there. We'll be going to Denver. 
and the Red Tree of Life will be going to Atlanta, Georgia. So uh, it's a great, all those public art programs are thrilled to have these pieces, and it's an interesting way to, to um, commission the art. Next spring, we'll be installing the work of uh, June Kaneko, and um, it will, the North Gallery, which is, this is a um, rendering of, will feature 26 characters from Japanese culture entitled Tanukis. From ancient time, the Japanese have expressed the Tanuki in a variety of ways, for they're said to be able to turn themselves into many things, but in modern times, they're most commonly portrayed as large, stout badgers. And these are ceramic pieces. Uh, as I said, there'll be 26 of them. And the way he's financing this exhibition is he's pre-selling each of these to collectors. They'll be in display for about a year, and then they'll be shipped to the collector. So um, we're only paying for shipping and installation, and uh, he's uh, financing the sculpture himself. We've had other exhibitions in the park, um, temporary exhibitions um, for the anniversary of the Plan of Chicago by Daniel Burnham in 2009, the 100th year anniversary. We did two pavilions. This is by Ben Van Berkel out of UN Studios in Amsterdam. And uh, we worked with the Art Institute to determine who we would ask to, to do these designs. They were here for the, through the summer until about October and then they were recycled. We had a little bit of a problem with this one, um, although we had posted with signs. Uh, young adults would um, delight in trying to figure out if they could run up the side of this and then get to the top. And um, we even put um, silicone on it to try to <laughs> make them slip, but that still didn't work. Uh, we also had a piece by Zaha Hadid out of London and uh, uh, installation on sort of the history of, of Chicago and the Burnham plan on the inside, uh, which was done by uh, Thomas Gray, uh, uh, who does uh, video, uh, historical videos in this case. And then the exterior was lit, uh, all was changing color. It was an incredible piece of fabric and aluminum. Once it was finished, we recycled it. How do we pay for all these things? The park cost about 470 million to build at the time when it was finished. And we uh, acknowledged all of the 115 donors, founders of Millennium Park, who gave a minimum of $1 million to get their name on the base of this recreation of an element that was part of the park, designed by Edward Bennett in uh, 19... 18 and torn down in 1953 to make way for the first underground garage. We brought it back then as the place to acknowledge it because the edge of Mixon Avenue was always part of the park and was an historic district. So the donor funded elements amounted to $220 million. Pretty much everything you see in Millennium Park on the surface is totally underwritten by private dollars. They weren't too happy about the $23 million for for Cloudgate, but uh, it was, uh, it's 26 there because the, the plaza cost $3 million. And I would like to mention some of the economic impact of Money Park. Even though the, uh, the press was highly critical of the project through the entire construction period of almost six years, <clears throat> they said it was a boondoggle, a project out of control, uh, they never really acknowledged the fact that many of the things that happened in Money Park, first of all, expanded by 50% area, so that was a big additional piece. Rebuilt an entire underground garage that was existing. <clears throat> and all the things that were paid for by donors were never part of the original project. So they always looked at the total number and thought that somehow they could make press by criticizing the mayor. <clears throat> but as soon as the park opened, it became the poster child for Chicago. It was resulted in huge, uh, over $2 billion in new construction around the park, uh, private construction. Suddenly, a dead zone of Michigan Avenue became a 
place you could hardly find a rent now, a place to rent along the street. Restaurants have cropped up. There are 10 condo projects that attribute their success to Money Park. We have four and a half million visitors a year now. And the first day that it opened on June, July 16th, 2004, we had 300,000 visitors come to the park because the press helped us because they criticized for all this time. So people had to really find out what all the hysteria was about. And as they came to the park, they discovered they loved the park. It is, has increased the, um, I'd say the, the perception of Chicago as, as a place. One more thing that makes it a destination, world destination, but it's also helped Chicagoans are uh, now, uh, the pride in, in their city has, has been incre increased by this because everyone who comes to Chicago, visitors for people who live here, the first thing they want to see is Millennium Park. And uh, this is the view from one of the high rises, the legacy at Millennium. These two condominium projects have only happened because of Millennium Park. The same developer, Mason developer, built these. And, and these were, properties that really contributed nothing to the tax, tax rolls of Chicago, and now they're really major um, benefits to Chicago taxes. So um, just some numbers, 71 increase in residential population, residential real estate since the park opened, 1.4 billion, $125 a square foot is paid for condo units with a park view. 24% increase in rent. Occupancy rates are higher than the rest of the city. Five hotels have happened, including the Radisson Blue, which just opened a half a block away. And there's an 18% increase in use of hotel rooms adjacent to the park. As I said, uh, the total increased value of, of residential devel development is 1.4 billion. That's enhanced from what the property actually was worth. And the estimated value of gross visitor spending, tributable money park is $1 billion a year. So when you look at, and most of the, I'd say a large part of that desire to be in money park is due to the public art. If it wasn't for Cloudgate and the Crown Fountain and our temporary exhibitions, it wouldn't be nearly as popular. And that's one reason why we have these exhibitions that occur approximately every two years. So um, we hope uh, after Jan, Jan Junkanico comes and does his uh, thing in the park to, for our 10th anniversary of the park, we're gonna have a huge fundraiser. We're planning to do uh, the fantastic fireworks display we did for the grand opening 2004 once again. But we also are negotiating with um, Joe May Plensa and Anish Kapoor to do temporary exhibitions uh, on the bowling galleries. So I think I'm doing fairly well at this point. I, that's the last slide, so I'm open to questions if anyone has any. Any, any sculptors out there who want their work exhibited in Monty Park? <laughs> uh, well, we have a curatorial committee it's made of the uh, curator for uh, the Nathan Manilow Park, the uh, Rondo from the Art Institute, uh, Darling from the MCA, myself, and the head of public art for the city of Chicago. And we look at everyone who makes a proposal. So send it to me. I won't give you my email address, though, or no, I will. It's ed.euler at mp inc dot org. Yes. Is there a place in town where there's a display of the photographs of the progress of just about you know, five weeks? Uh, yes, there is. Actually, if you go to the public library website, they have six thousand photographs of um, the progress of Millennium Park. Now, I'm not sure. You can access, I th think you can access them, them if you don't have a library card, but there must be a way to do it. But that's where it is. And actually, I had a book here. Yeah, 
if you're, if you're interested in learning about the history of Monty Park, this was just published about a year ago. It's called Monty Park, Chicago. The author is Cheryl Kent. And there's actually a lot of photographs, not construction, but photographs and history of, of all of the art and architecture of the park, published by Northwestern University Press. And you can probably get it uh, on Amazon.com for 10 bucks or less or more. Uh, it's in the, uh, I don't know if it's in the Art Institute bookstore, but it's in the Chicago Architectural Foundation bookstore, which is on Michigan Avenue, 2400 South Michigan. Oh, I see. Uh, Bill Fontana is here. Why don't you show, show yourself, Bill, so they can see who did uh, Soaring Echoes. Yes. Um, well, in, in the case Yvonne, I mean, those art programs all were sort of, um, we, we, Yvonne and myself, we, we give lectures all over the country and the world. She wanted to make sure they went to uh, cities that had an Hispanic population, a larger Hispanic population, uh, just demonstrates that, uh, that art in, in Mexico is viable, great art. And um, so it's always different. Um, and it's really up to the artist on how that work will be distributed. June uh, Canico is selling those pieces. So if um, you're interested in buying one of his pieces, and it's not only the, the badger, uh, he'll have uh, Danko's, I think, and some other columns that he's done, and other, those are existing works that he'll also be selling. So you can contact his office and try to negotiate a number. Yes. Well, the mayor is, if you know Mayor Daly, he's a pretty stubborn guy, and he's not going to let the press intimidate him. So basically, even though the press was very critical, he said, I don't care what the press says. You know, you only get one chance to do a project of this right, so let's, let's make sure we do it. And the donor community, who were getting a little nervous about all the criticism, and before we had all the donors signed up, it was harder to convince them to give a million dollars. So they, um, but we had one very strong leader. I think the two critical things in, in the park is you needed a strong mayor who was going to be in office for a while so you could do like a project like this. Uh, and you needed a very strong civic leader. In this case was John Brine, who is the, was at the time the uh, uh, CEO of Sara Lee Corporation. And he pretty much in his Blue Ribbon Committee, his executive committee knew everyone in town, knew, knew everyone who had money. And uh, it, it got to be a joke that if you got a call from John Bryan, you better run from the hills because he was going to ask you for a minimum of a million dollars. We actually wound up having 10 donors who gave $5 million, and that allowed them to have a place in the park with their own name. And we had two at 10 and one at 15. So the Crown family gave 10. The fountain cost $17 million to build. Uh, we, we had a hard time with some of the donors. Um, uh, McDonald's is a donor, and they underwrote the bike station, and they wanted the golden arches in the park, and we said, no, we were willing to turn down $4 million if that was the case. So, but they wanted to improve the, their image as a corporation that promotes healthy lifestyles. So putting their name on the, on the bike station and underwriting an exercise program that occurs during the summer every Saturday morning for uh, four hours, Tai Chi, Zumba, yoga. You can have your egg McMuffin and spend four hours trying to get rid of those calories. <laughs> yes? What was, there, what was in your past or events or, or training something that gave you the, the ability, the confidence to, to actually do something like this? I was stupid. <laughs> Um, no, I think um, my experience, 
then the mayor uh, wanted me because of the handicapped issue and you know, sort of redesigned the park to be accessible. But then I'd had a long history at the parks, uh, 25 years preserving art um, and making sure it got uh, cataloged, recognized, and preserved. But my experience, I'm an architect, so um, doing parks for 25 years was also my credential. Um, but dealing with big egos was a problem. Um, would be a problem for somebody with a big ego, so I have a very small ego, so I, I was able to overcome some of those egos and try to make them work together. But I also had a title. I was assistant to the mayor and project design director. So uh, dealing with the other architects and planners and designers and artists and the city departments, I was elevated because they were all afraid of the mayor. And if I threatened to go back and tell the mayor, they would capitulate. So um, that was a, a, my, my car. My, ace in the hole, they say. So it, it helped. And then I was going to quit several times in the process, but it reached a point where I said, you know, I can't quit now. And I was afraid that people would pan the project. I mean, the critics were, were uh, not revealing their feelings about the park, even though I tried to get them to sort of understand what was happening and to give them tours. Uh, the one uh, architectural critic in Chicago, Blair Kamen, loves the park after it was opened. He was very glowing about uh, what the great thing it was for Chicago. He's written about five, about eight articles on various aspects of the park, all positive. And then Robert Campbell, who's the architectural critic for the Boston Globe, got a chance to visit and said, in his opinion, and he's been all over the world, it's the best new design for an urban park in the world. So those kind of things turned out okay. I didn't have to leave town, <laughs> which might have happened, by the way. Yes? Can you speak a little bit about plans for Maggie Daly Park and art there? Or, or uh, yeah, it was uh, done by Michael Van Valkenburg, but it, you know, it's, it's been somewhat reduced from the grandiose scheme they had initially because of funding. But it will be geared toward, um, toward maybe families and children, so it's going to have a really interesting landscape. It'll have a skating path, which will be mechanically frozen, but instead of a rink, like we have in Millennium Park, it'll be a path that will wind through a landscape during the winter, and that'll be used for rollerblading or other kinds of things during the summer. It'll have climbing walls, skateboard parks, um, a unique um, uh, sort of destination playgrounds, and um, a um, ecological um, landscape. Now, they're there, I think there's an opportunity maybe to, to add art, but that'll come at a later point. And that construction, the, the thing that people will be horrified about is that it, that project is built over a garage. And when you look across this 20 acres, it will be totally removed. All those trees will come down and uh, they have to we re-waterproof the garage because it's leaking, and that was the whole reason for this park happening. We're a little worried uh, when the, they do the demolition, we think that all the rabbits, the rats, and the squirrels will be running across Frank's Bridge and the, you know, <laughs> taking up residence in Millennium Park, so we're gonna put a gate up. Rabbits are a bit of a problem in the park. We have, last year we caught 60 rabbits. But we released them in the, in the western suburbs, so not, not to be afraid. <laughs> Uh, any more questions? Can you tell us a bit about um, the endowment and how how you fund the maintenance and the programming and the ongoing operations of of the park? Yeah, it's uh, really unique. It probably, it is in the program is still a private par public partnership. Our endowment is approach is about twenty million now. There's restricted in, restricted amounts. The, the we are responsible for maintaining the Lurie Garden. There's a $10 million endowment for that, which, which really does a good job of taking care of it. We have about uh, $3.7 million for the Boeing galleries that under, and we only use the, the interest on the principal, and it's not been that great these last few years, but we're still committed to do these things. Uh, and then we have some unrestricted endowment that we use for, for uh, paying salaries. Some of the other staff, um, 
we have another endowment for programming. And we hope to grow our endowment to a total of $50 million over the next uh, few years. So that will allow us to do more in the area of programming, like the Bill Fontana, uh, Soaring Echoes. That was funded out of our uh, general fund. But if we had an endowment that would uh, underwrite those kinds of efforts, we were anxious to do that. And by the way, the programming is, this is the only park in the city that is owned and operated by the city of Chicago. All the other parks, including the rest of Grand Park, are owned and operated and programmed by the Chicago Park District. But the Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events does all the programming. They mount all these 50 or about 60 major concerts a year. There are 500 free programs that one can partake in over the course of a year. That's all done in-house by their program staff. And um, they pretty much pay for programming and maintenance of the park out of the revenues they receive from bus shelter advertising. The deco advertising that generates about $7 million a year that is used, uh, donated, or dedicated to the park programs and maintenance. Yes? Pardon? Well, I used to work for the Park District, and I, I know they wouldn't sort of understand a cultural um, park because uh, they don't have culture in their name. It's the Department of Cultural Affairs has culture, so they know about that. Um, but um, it is um, the program staff, we, it, the Park District really doesn't have the kind of staff it wouldn't be necessary to, to program a major venue like um, the Pritzker Pavilion or do all the other programs that that we uh, have in the park and offer. So, and also the park, the city owned the site. You know, when I mentioned the railroad, they actually own it fee simple, so until bonds are retired, they, they continue to, to operate it. I don't think they'll ever give it up, though. They like it. Any more questions? Yeah, with the uh, economic impact of the park, is the city considering doing other less desirable areas? Uh, under the same sort of art theme? Uh, I think so. I think, uh, you know, Mayor uh, Emanuel is, is um, interested in doing a number of parks. Uh, he's, he's looking at different areas. He's doing boathouses along the Chicago River so we can introduce water sports like sculling and canoeing, kayaking to the Chicago River, which is gradually getting cleaned up. There's a commitment to um, increase the bike trails in Chicago, not only along the river, but there's a project called the Bloomingdale Trail, which is sort of similar to the High Line in New York City, but it's longer and it will allow bikes to, to use it. That's a project that will have public art as a, as a product of the design. And it was integral with the planning process for that park that an art um, curator was involved in, in looking at where those pieces could go. And so there will be, um, soon there'll be, I think, requests for proposals for, for uh, various um, ideas along the trail. And so the, the park has, you know, there's art, temporary art throughout the park system, not only Lincoln Park, but there's that one lakefront uh, art installation now of sculpture along the lakefront, which I think is in your package. But it costs a lot of money. It takes a real effort to, I don't think it could have happened to, tomorrow if we wanted to do Millennium Park. Because when it happened and when the money was being raised, uh, the economy was in much better shape and uh, people were more willing to give their money. But we're still getting donors committed to, to enhancing our endowment. Any more questions? No? Okay.